Are we all ready then? Ladies and geeks, it is my great pleasure and privilege to introduce a man whose games I have played and enjoyed for years. A man with a unique perspective on game design and development. Whether he's playing bass in a Sid Rock band or working on new games, he's still an important voice in the industry. I give you John Hare. And this is the sensible guide to John Hare. S is for starting out. How did you get started in drawing graphics and designing games? Okay, it's a good question for my rubbish I bought with me. I went through, I didn't sort this out properly, so when I was, I was leaving this morning, this afternoon, I, I found those old files and just chucked them in the car, drove up. Um, I've got a lot of stuff which, which shows you how we started out, because I mean, it, when, it, when you're working in a company, people know you, what you've done, and you've had games, and people know they are, it appears that you have always been of a certain size or influence, but sensible like every other developer started out as just literally a couple of guys in the bedroom. Um, I started off sensible with, with my friend Chris, we were in the same maths class at school in the fifth year when we were 15, uh, and we played in a band together. Chris was a brilliant guitarist and I wanted to be a singer and I had an acoustic and I learnt bass to support Chris's guitar playing to be honest. Uh, but after a while of playing music, we started, Chris taught himself how to program. I had uh, gone to college and studied theatre design and some art stuff. And I was helping out with some graphics and we went both from being unemployed basically to work in the games industry. So, after six to seven months working for another company and finding out they were taking 85% of the money and we were doing about 99% of the work, we set up our own company called Sensible Software and I brought with me, this is very, very rare, okay, but I found it this morning. This is a, an original piece of Sensible Software letter-headed paper. The address, the address is Chris's dad's house because we started working in his bedroom. <laughs> um, what I'll do is I'll give this to you if you want to do a, a little auction prize of stuff. I'll give a small percentage of this stuff away here, like some photos and bits, and this will be one of the things. This is a, this is a, there's only three sheets I've got in my house, now I've got two, so this is pretty bloody rare stuff, so. Um, so that's how we started out, we were just two, two mates playing in a band, we decided to make games, we struck it lucky pretty early, our first game we, we, um, we were 19 years old, we set our company up two months beforehand, uh, we produced one public, no, two published games and one unpublished game between us by that time. Uh, we got a train up to, to Manchester to see Ocean with our new game, which was Parallax. Uh, it was fantastic. We went in, we, we chatted to Colin Stokes. Um, we uh, then got taken to see uh, John Woods, who was one of the two owners of Ocean. This is the first day, like we're 19 year old kids, remember. John Woods is a hugely powerful businessman. Uh, he sat us down, said, I've been told your demo is quite good, we want to sign your game. £5,000. He gave us a contract to sign and a cheque for a grand and we went back on the train the same day thinking we'd uh, made it. Uh, but it was brilliant and, and that's what it was like. That's literally how we started. That's how it kicked off. We did Parallax and then uh, I was doing all the art. Chris was doing all the programming. We were designing everything between us. And then we did we signed Wisp All Up. We did Galaxy Birds and a couple of other budget games and that's, that's really how we kicked off pretty much the first year, year and a half. And did Ocean put on you, any pressure on you to come up with the next game quickly? Or, or was it a case of when it was ready, you went to them with Wizball and said, here it is? Basically, in those days, all the games we did, and I'm talking almost up to uh, even when we did Sensible Soccer, and I've got some stuff here I can show you that, which will make you laugh a minute. Um, we pretty much did what the hell we wanted. We didn't, we weren't told when, well, we had deadlines, like if you got a, a World Cup and you've got to get your football game for the World Cup, the World Cup's not going to move. If you've got a game to get out for Christmas, it's got to come out for Christmas. These deadlines have always been there, but that, that aside, I think um, Parallax came out in November, from my recollection, and Wisble came out in the May afterwards. And we pretty much just were on a creative role, we did what the hell we wanted, and Wisble was the next thing that came out. That's, that's pretty much why we ended up with Wisble. 
And I, I might say so add, I, I tend to go on, so it gets boring. <laughs> right. um, what, what we ended up doing with Whiskid, with all those bits running around and going underground and uh, little adventures, is actually what the original intention was to put in Whisk Ball, we just run out of time. So, there you go. That's so interesting, moving on. E is for earning a reputation. How important was the company's reputation and the critical acclaim you got from the magazines at the time? Well, it's interesting. So when we when we started off doing um, the Commodore 64 stuff, we, we did uh, Parallax, then Wizball. Wizball got the acclaim more than Parallax did. Parallax got us known by people in the industry, but not generally to people. Um, and then we did, I think it was shooting up the construction kit. We started off as another shooting up but turned into a, a tool. And then we did Micro Soccer and uh, what happened after that? It would have been 3D Tennis I think. And then we did like, a bunch of budget games in the middle, just like Galaxy Birds was a week. It was just a, a joke. Uh, oh No was a couple of weeks ripping off an arcade machine. Um, Insects in Space was, a, was obviously an obviously stupid Defender clone. Um, but we, we, we discovered with Megalomania, Megalomania was our big breakthrough game because it was the first one we'd done just on the Amiga and it was a very ambitious game actually. Now we'd, we'd been working, no one's ever seen this stuff before. This is, this is a game called, where is it? We worked on a game called Touchstone for a while, okay? Now Touchstone was with Martin, Martin Gore who was the, um, sound guy for Ocean, as you all know, did all the fantastic tunes. And he joined me in Prisby. It's the only time we ever took on a third partner in the company. And I basically started working with this game design, and Martin was working on the programming, and we were doing this kind of, it was an adventure game with maps and shit like this, okay? This is how I would work. So just drawing maps and stuff. Um, and then writing all these plots about this is a ridiculously ambitious game for Commodore 64. Okay, but we had good contact with the guys uh, in Origin who were doing the Ultima series. So we, we talked to them for about six months about signing this up. In the end, they didn't sign sign the game up. They kind of signed up the prototype and then dropped it. Um, interesting, of course, Martin would have to work for Origin. I don't know if any of you guys know that afterwards. So that was how Martin's contact first came in there. And a lot, a lot of the ideas from uh, Touchstone you can actually find in a game called Times of Law, which is a which is a overhead view yes. role playing game. Correct, correct. There's there's a lot of that stuff, but it just happens. I mean, Touchstone is a stupid game. The idea was that I'll tell you the plot if you want, want to know it. It's an adventure game set in a in a, in a fictitious world, and uh, the plot was that let me remember this guy was dying. And this person was in love with the guy's daughter, and he had to bring the father back to life in order for him to cast some magic for them to get together. That was kind of the plot. So you had to explore the world, you had to go, then go effectively like the, what was it called? The, there's a film where people got in this tiny submarine and went through people's veins and drove along. Correct. So there was a bit like that where you went in the body and you cured it. Then there was a bit where you went in his mind and a bit where you went in his soul. So it's all like, four layers of adventure game and all the things being exchanged. It was stupidly ambitious, so that got nowhere, as a lot of our ambitious stuff did actually. So we started working on this game called Megalomania, okay? Now I'll show you Megalomania, and that's for later. Right, so Megalomania, and it, this is literally how we work. These, these are the maps for Megalomania Islands. So if anyone's played Megalomania, that's it, that's how it starts off. You know, it's just squared paper with drawings like that's how i work you know that's it yeah. so then you write loads of lists of which elements it says on here it says it's got some numbers i don't know what the numbers mean actually and then it says the population and the maximum tech level that they can get to and stuff and it started off megalomania as a game where you flew around in a spaceship and and all the um it's got loads of icons here from the through all the different elements and other stuff. And uh, you flew around in the spaceship and you actually landed on these islands. And then you did all the mining and stuff and you get in the game. But the, the game initially had a totally different layer to it where you, were, you had space flying around fighting. And the whole technology was about 
uh, the technology for you.